Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Friday, October 15th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, a proposal for approaching this next phase of the pandemic less like an epidemiologist and more like an engineer. Plus, new findings from the Mars Perseverance rover that has NASA breathing a sigh of relief. And product placement in novels added without the author's knowledge. It's a real thing that I hope remains in the past. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So, a paper published in August by epidemiologists and statisticians reflecting on shortcomings of the pandemic response from the public health sector proposes a new approach, one that looks a lot more like engineering than epidemiology. Essentially, quoting the MIT Technology Review, focusing on pragmatic problem solving with an iterative, adaptive strategy to make things work. End quote. During the pandemic, the paper's authors felt that, quote, the right balance between pure research results and pragmatic solutions proved alarmingly elusive, end quote. Epidemiologist and co-author of the paper, John Zellner from the University of Michigan, noted that there were, quoting the MIT Tech Review, missing links between the ideas and tools epidemiologists proposed and the world they were meant to help. End quote. And as I was reading through the paper and a new write-up about it by Siobhan Roberts in the MIT Tech Review, I was thinking about how their call for an engineer's perspective in epidemiology could also be applied to how we as individuals might logistically and emotionally respond to the pandemic as we enter what more and more people are calling an age of ongoing uncertainty. It's weird to say that we're approaching a period of uncertainty when it feels like the whole pandemic has been one of uncertainty. I mean, what did every brand, email, and commercial say in spring of 2020? In these uncertain times. But for however uncertain things may have been, people have always tried to find certain solutions. And now as we approach this weird mix of vaccinations and variants, experts have been pretty upfront about the fact that they're not positive if we've truly seen the last surge or if we're looking at the calm before another storm. And more and more of them are telling us we need to lean into that uncertainty. In a piece for The Atlantic that Jason shared on Kotke.org earlier this week, internist Lucy McBride reflected on how many of her patients are desperate for black and white answers. They want to be told it's perfectly safe to do something, or even told absolutely don't do it, just anything that's a direct answer to end their infinite loop of risk calculating. But, McBride wrote, quote, The two things that patients want, reassurance that they won't get COVID-19 and permission to engage in life, I cannot deliver, and I never will be able to. SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay. The virus will be woven into our everyday existence, much like RSV, influenza, and other common coronaviruses are. The question isn't whether we'll be exposed to the novel coronavirus, it's when. And although many of us will inevitably get COVID-19, for the majority of vaccinated people, it won't be so bad. The vaccines weren't designed to wholly prevent COVID-19. They transformed it into a manageable illness like the flu. That means that, from a decision-making perspective, we're starting to reach the acceptance phase of the pandemic, a time when we must recalibrate our individual risk gauges, which have been completely thrown out of whack. The approach I'm embracing with patients boils down to a secular version of the serenity prayer. We need the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. End quote. Recognizing what we can change and accepting what we can't goes back to that engineering approach. Quoting again from the MIT Tech Review, For Seth Kukema, co-director of the Center for Risk Analysis and Informed Decision Engineering at the University of Michigan, a key aspect of the engineering approach is diving into the uncertainty, analyzing the mess, and then taking a step back with the perspective, we have to make practical decisions, so how much does the uncertainty really matter? Because if there's a lot of uncertainty, and if the uncertainty changes what the optimal decisions are or even what the good decisions are, then that's really important to know, says Kukema. But if it doesn't really affect what my decisions are, then it's less critical. 
For instance, increasing SARS-CoV-2 vaccination coverage across the population is one scenario in which, even if there is some uncertainty regarding exactly how many cases or deaths vaccination will prevent, the fact that it is highly likely to decrease both with few adverse effects is motivation enough to decide that a large-scale vaccination program is a good idea. End quote. And co-author Zellner adds, quote, Often these problems require iterative solutions, where you're making changes in response to what does or doesn't work. You continue to update what you're doing as data comes in, and you see the successes and failures of your approach. To me, that's very different and better suited to the complex, non-stationary problems that define public health than the kind of static, one-and-done image a lot of people have of academic science, where you have a big idea, test it, and your result is preserved in amber for all time. End quote. One of the biggest hurdles of the pandemic and part of the inspiration for this paper has been a disconnect in communication between public health experts and the public. Even as so many people became amateur epidemiologists and statisticians trying to learn everything they could from the deluge of preprints and local government press conferences and op-eds, there remained for many a misunderstanding of the scientific process and a skepticism of the expertise of qualified scientists. So even while this paper urges fellow epidemiologists to think more iteratively and intentionally partner with others who can more effectively communicate research results, it's also on us non-experts to remember that changes and recommendations are results of a fast-moving situation and a positive sign of research in action, not a reason to mistrust or suspect ulterior motives. But more than that, because I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, we need to work on accepting those changes in our day-to-day -day lives. Accept the need to iterate. And accept when you can't. If you're burnt out on decision-making and risk assessment, maybe it could help to try to channel your inner engineer at times. Going back to McBride, quote, Acceptance is not about agreeing with or surrendering to suffering. It's not about reckless abandonment of caution or carelessness towards others. It means letting go of the false promise of COVID-0, taking an honest assessment of our personal risk tolerance, and ceding control where control isn't possible. It's about getting vaccinated against COVID and the flu before attending a wedding in person instead of watching the nuptials on Zoom. Acceptance doesn't prescribe the same set of behaviors for all. My immunosuppressed octogenarian patient, for example, may decide to mask indoors indefinitely rather than risk getting a respiratory virus again. Parents of children under the age of 12 might continue to avoid indoor social events until a COVID vaccine is available for that age group. But when we accept that an encounter with the coronavirus is at some point inevitable, knowing that with vaccination we've shielded ourselves from severe outcomes and reduced the likelihood of transmission to other people, we'll have an opportunity to regain some of the contours of regular life. Public health experts will be responsible for deciding where the off-ramps are for restrictions such as mask mandates in public places, but we as individuals are responsible for dusting off our pre-pandemic instincts and imagining living again. Doctoring isn't about walling off patients from certain exposures, it's about acknowledging our messy world and arming patients with tools to safely inhabit it. Right now, it's about helping patients redefine health as more than simply not getting COVID. End quote. It's been a while since we've checked in on little Perseverance, and it turns out that the Mars rover is doing quite well. In the first academic paper published using images taken by Perseverance since it landed on Mars in February 2021, it was confirmed that the part of the Jezero crater the rover has been studying was indeed once a delta where a river system met lake water. Co-lead author Sanjeev Gupta from Imperial College London said to the BBC, quote, People have said to me, so what's new here? Didn't we know there was a delta in Jezero Crater? Well, actually, we didn't. We'd inferred from orbital imagery that Jezero contained a delta, but until you get down on the ground, you can't be absolutely sure. End quote. With the huge amount of money, resources, and attention on this mission, it was a huge relief to NASA to confirm the presence of this delta and the floor of what was once a massive lake over three and a half billion years ago. 
Focusing on a formation called Kodiak Butte, researchers analyzing the images from Perseverance have been able to get a closer look at the bottommost layer, which is made of sandstone and mudstone. Quoting Time, As on Earth, any biology that emerged in the Jezero waters would most likely have settled into the mud and sand at the base. What we observed at Kodiak was our key observation, says study lead planetary geologist Nicholas Mangold. If there are signs of ancient life in a formation like this, it would typically be in sandstone, which is the bottom set. End quote. But even more than confirmation that they really, truly are in the right location to be finding signs of ancient life, the images revealed another intriguing geological discovery near the former delta that now looks like a fan-shaped formation. Quoting again from Time, Like Kodiak, the western fan was built slowly over time by the deposition of sedimentary layers transported by water. Unlike Kodiak, the fan appears to have had a violent history, as evidenced by two dozen large boulders and hundreds of smaller cobbles embedded in the fan walls high above the crater floor. These were not slowly, gently sedimented in a place, rather they were hoisted and tossed by periodic flash flooding powerful enough to move such heavy objects. The presence of flooding, the researchers wrote, suggests a warm and even humid Mars, one on which floods could have been caused by rains or snowmelt, though Mangold concedes that, for now, is mere speculation. End quote. The BBC notes that Perseverance will next be sent to the base of the ancient delta to drill for samples, and do the same thing at a ring of carbonate rocks on the edge of the Jezero crater where the shores of the lake might once have been. None of the samples being taken by Perseverance will be returned to Earth until the early 30s, when NASA and the ESA send another rover to retrieve them. But in the meantime, we have further reassurance that we are on the right track, and Perseverance has plenty more juice to keep digging for several more years to come. With how inundated we are by ads in every facet of our lives, billboard-like physical ads in increasingly novel and pernicious incarnations, unskippable ads on autoplaying videos, the unshakable ghoul of targeted ads on every app that you touch, it comes as quite a relief to open up a book and not be bombarded by advertisements. Except, of course, sometimes on the last page of a book where there used to be order forms for similar titles, or if you use an e-reader that runs ads on the home screen. But rest assured, unlike a YouTube video broken up by five mid-roll ads, your reading experience won't be interrupted by any sponsored content. It turns out, however, that that wasn't always the case. Ads in books were certainly a thing in about the 60s and 70s, you know, full-page ads that would be inserted into the middle of books, totally unrelated to the story, kind of like a magazine ad. You've likely come across some of these at used bookstores, or you remember them from the time. But at least in parts of Europe, shortly before that, there began a tradition of inserting product placement into the translations of cheap genre fiction. And if at least one story is to believed, the authors usually weren't told. This incident got rehashed at the end of last month when Neil Gaiman reminded us all on Twitter of the time in the 90s that Terry Pratchett discovered that his German publisher had been inserting soup ads into the text of his novels without telling him, and refused to stop doing it. Clearly, Pratchett broke the deal with that publisher, Hain, and switched to another one, Goldman, because, yeah, whoa. Here's what Pratchett said about the situation, quote, there were a number of reasons for switching to Goldman, but a deeply personal one for me was the way Hain, in Sorcery, I think, though it may have been in other books, inserted a soup advert in the text. A few black lines and then something like, Around now our heroes must be pretty hungry, and what better than a nourishing bowl, etc, etc. My editor was pretty sick about it, but the company wouldn't promise not to do it again, so that made it very easy to leave them. They did it to Ian Banks, too, and apparently at a con he tore out the offending page and ate it without croutons. End quote. So yeah, it wasn't just Pratchett, it was tons of authors. Explaining the phenomenon back in 2011, a German blogger recollected seeing ads written into the story for at least one Star Trek novel, and that blogger, as well as people responding to Gaiman on Twitter, managed to pull up photographic examples of this happening in multiple of Pratchett's books. 
As the German blogger wrote, quote, The whole thing was a holdover from the 50s or 60s, when practices like that were more common, especially with publishers of cheap genre fiction. They were rather popular for pulling in additional revenue on cheaply priced paperbacks that might not make their money back, and as the genres were not really seen as literature at all by anyone who mattered, fans and editors often had to fight bloody battles to get their stuff published even if it did go to bestseller in the end. End quote. And he further explains that it was definitely weird for this to still be happening in the 90s, especially for books that were priced rather high on their own, but that it was probably just a corporate holdover that no one really questioned until one of their biggest authors found out and dropped them over it. Do check out the photos in the show notes because even without being able to read German, it's pretty wild to see a logo for five minute soups stamped onto the bottom of an otherwise normal page of a novel. All I have to say is that I really hope Jeff Bezos and all the heads of the big four publishers aren't listening because I do not want them getting any ideas. If you're spending the weekend brainstorming what to be for Halloween or working on your costume, ketchup makers Heinz have got you covered. They just released a special limited edition version of their ketchup that's labeled Tomato Blood. Available in stores or online, Heinz is leaning into the idea of the age-old prank of using ketchup as fake blood with the tagline, If you have Heinz, you have a costume. In addition to individual bottles of the Tomato Blood branded ketchup, you can also buy a costume kit which comes with an honest-to-god makeup brush, sponge, and palette, as well as fun add-ons like vampire teeth, temporary tattoos, rhinestones, and spooky eyelashes. Plus, in a move that makes me feel like they should be doing a post-Halloween cross-promotional deal with Tide, they're also selling a collection of four different, mostly white costumes ready for you to decorate with their tomato blood sold separately. You can get a pirate, a mummy, a mad scientist, or a corpse bride costume in adult or kid sizes, although they are selling very fast. And I gotta say, I appreciate how all-in they went on this. You know, so many limited to Edition items from brands are just one-off jokes that aren't even sold in stores just online. Heinz is putting this in stores and created an entire line of non-ketchup products to go along with it. Pretty well done. But that is it from me for this week. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday.